I'm sitting down with Gene Sharp. His book, From Dictatorship to Democracy, is seen by many as a guide on how to carry out a revolution through nonviolent means. It's often referred to as the Bible of color revolutions. Dr. Sharp, looking at how revolutions unfold in the Arab world, do you see it as transition from dictatorship to democracy? I see a first step in that transition in terms of bringing down the old system, the old dictatorial system. And it doesn't seem to you that people there are trading one form of oppression for another? That often happens. That often happens, and it's a good step to bring down the old oppression, but it's not sufficient. So they have to be very careful. Well, it seems the Egyptians weren't very careful. What they have now is their military brutally cracking down on protesters. We hear about all kinds of abuses. Islamists are gaining power in the country. My question is this, what kind of democracy could the current state of affairs in Egypt possibly create? See, the, the rebels made a mistake. They should never agree the Mubarak's condition of give the power over to the army and then I'll resign. That was foolish because that uh, army has just been the agent of repression in Egypt for decades, and they're not going to change overnight. It's unclear what their strategy is. I don't know. I don't have detailed information of what their planning is at all. But that's a different kind of situation than the predominantly nonviolent struggle movement. Well, it did start out as a largely non-violent popular uprising, but we see what it turned into. Could it be that your concept of non-violent uprisings is kind of overdue in this day and age? I mean, look at the Arab world. It's a bloody mess. You get bloody messes when you get people standing up and saying we want a change. Because dictators don't like to be told we don't love you anymore. They don't like to be told it's time for you to go and they will use whatever means of control and repression and killing and intimidation they can muster. And one should not be surprised at that. So uprisings like that can't be nonviolent in principle? They can. If they go into violence, many, many more will die. The violence is not a solution to people dying. Many, many people are killed in violent uprisings and civil wars and international military intervention and die in the face of nonviolent sorrow, as in Syria, for example, when many have died. Now, if they go to a civil war or foreign intervention in Syria, many, many, many more will die. It's absolutely predictable. The Syrian opposition absolutely refuses to talk to the government. Don't you think it deepens the crisis, adds to the violence? What they are doing there in refusing to negotiate because negotiations are a way, a trick that the government, the oppressive governments use to get the resistors not to resist. But you don't negotiate with a dictatorship, you have to throw it out. But, but that situation basically rules out non-violent struggle that you were talking about. It provokes violence. It's causing the regime to use violence, maybe. You expect that. So people should be dying in the name of revolution? Is that what you're saying? You seem to have a, a built-in assumption that only violent means are powerful, quite to the contrary. No, I just see a bloody mess instead of the idyllic nonviolent surge that you're writing about in the book. Let me ask you this. The U.S., NATO have set a precedent with the military intervention in Libya. Could it do you think it creates a situation in Syria where radical elements among the Syrian opposition are more inclined to provoke the authorities in order to invite an intervention? I think that inviting an interve military intervention is very dangerous and undesirable. And if the Libyans and some Syrians have been doing that, that's very unfortunate because that will not help. That will not bring a democracy. That will be a victory by the outside military forces. Means, assuming you get rid of the old regime, then the new regime will be heavily influenced by the powers that intervened, the U.S. and France or whoever else does it. They will have a major say over that what kind of a government that happens, and that's not in the power of the Syrian people themselves, which is what things should be. Is that what happened in Libya? 
Yes. In your opinion, what's in it for the U.S. when it decides to meddle in foreign revolutions, in foreign affairs? You know that they bother better than I do, you know. I'm not talking about the U.S. policy. Why? Let's talk about it. Why? My what opinion is the U.S. government should not be intervening in the military in the name of establishing democracies because it, it doesn't work and they can serve other objectives. What about non-military means? It seems they're using all kinds of means. Non-military means of struggle should be used not by the U.S. government but by the people of that country to get rid of the dictatorship themselves. A lot of people are getting the sense that Washington is more into establishing friendly regimes rather than democracies. If we um, take Libya, for example, people there are afraid to speak up right now. I mean, we have reporters on the ground and they have to blur people's faces all the time because people are afraid of uh, being seen. The leadership there is about to introduce Sharia laws, the basis for their new laws, which is pretty much incompatible with democratic values. So Libya pretty much looks like an example of uh, how instead uh, of a supposed transition to democracy, people uh, are getting pretty much the opposite. No, I think Libya is a different case because that's a case where the change was not brought down by a nonviolent revolution. Foreign forces combined with civil war brought down the Gaddafi regime. That's not an example of relevant to nonviolent struggle at all. On a slightly different note, Occupy Wall Street, a very peaceful movement by all standards. Do you find them effective? No. No. It's, it's a symbolic protest. People are, are annoyed, more than annoyed, they're very angry at the extreme limited political control they have, uh, the extreme dis maldistribution of power. Some of those people are making an expression of their opinions. That's only symbolism. Symbolism does not change the distribution of wealth in a country. So you're saying no change is possible through that kind of nonviolent action? That's right. Except to change opinions, maybe but that's not sufficient. Let's get back to the Arab world. People there seem to be getting more and more convinced that nonviolence doesn't get them anywhere either. Do you think change can be brought about only through revolution? No, change can be brought about in many ways. But what kind of change? Exactly. I'm glad you brought that up because it seems the way it is now is people take to the streets with genuine aspirations, but those who take advantage of those uprisings end up stepping on people's rights as well as their predecessors had. Change can be from dictatorship to a new dictatorship. Of course, that was Aristotle's politics in a study many, many years ago. But that, that does not mean it's inevitable. By all means, the kind of action that you choose to use will help to determine what kind of results you get. It's very clear that that requires extreme care and extreme good judgment and clear thinking and strong action to prevent that from happening. I see a contradiction between this idealist view of a nonviolent revolution and, and reality. You know, someone said, and I don't remember who it was, but it goes, any revolution is started by idealists, carried out by fanatics, and taken advantage of by bastards, by scoundrels. <laughs> it might be true, but not any revolution. Some are different. In your work, you outlined the steps that would make a revolution happen. But what I think was overlooked is life after a revolution. And in most cases, it is a sad tale. You're wise to be concerned about that. I didn't overlook it. Because in, including, in concluding pages of that particular essay, it, it warns about that. It's not a sort of solution to what to do exactly, but it warns about it. But that warning of yours is being largely ignored, don't you think? I believe that. That's a problem. That's why we've got more work going on. Thank you very much for the interview. It's been a pleasure.